basically you uh, are the first generation that did not serve uh, in my war. Family, so yes. which wars have you had family members serve in? So, because um, I know everybody's going to be really interested in that. My dad was in World War II. He was in Patton's Third Army, um, 35th Division, and uh, was actually captured at Bastogne. My great, my grandfather was in the Spanish-American War, as short as that lasted. Um, my great-great-grandfather, I'm sorry, my great-grandfather was in Civil War, as was his father, so my great-great-grandfather. And then supposedly we had a relative, which would have been a great-great-great-grandfather, um, that the family originally came from Vermont, and uh, he served in the Revolution. So the story goes. Right, right. We haven't been able to really trace back that far to find anything definitive on him. Um, on my, um, on the Civil War relatives, my great-grandfather was 21 when he served. Oh, wow. He wow. was in a unit called the 2nd New York Mounted Rifles. Um, he joined first the 7th New York Cavalry, which was a 90-day regiment. Uh, after, uh, it was in 1862. Um, after uh, his 90 days, General McClellan said, we don't need all these cavalry guys. This uh, war isn't going to last that long. Send them all home. So I guess really? he was a little wrong. But he, uh, in 1864, now this is after Gettysburg and just how bloody everything was, right. um, he re-enlisted into a new unit called the 2nd New York Mounted Rifles. And uh, with him he brought his father, who was 51 when he joined. Um, his father was, uh, my great-great-grandfather, was um, got only not, not only the New York State bounty to join, but also a bounty from um, the Net County of Niagara, where I lived, and he got $300 to go as a substitute. So uh, that was big, big money. bucks back then was... Yeah, that was a year's wages. So he went um, for another, for a local uh, uh, family that they were friends with uh, a guy that got drafted in Burt Van Horn was actually running for governor in New York State at the time. He didn't win, but uh, he was a prominent businessman in a little town called Newfane, which my great grandfather and great great grandfather were from. Uh, the uh, younger one of the two, my great grandfather, survived the war. He was uh, wounded at Petersburg, came back, uh, joined the army, ended up with Custer's division in the cavalry. And they were, their unit was Special Escort to General Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. Um, his father wasn't so fortunate. He was killed at the Battle of Cold Harbor. And at wow. 51 years old, um, um, his son there had to, had, when he was, my great-great-grandfather was 51, but he had to write a letter home to my great-grandmother, you know, that dad right. got killed and we right. buried him. And if you go down to the National mm -hmm. Cemetery down there, he does have a marked grave. He's one of the few that do. There's so many that were unknown from that battle. Mm -hmm. About 7,000 killed in 15 minutes. So uh, he was very fortunate. The little boy on his lap is my dad. Oh, wow. That's so awesome. My dad's grandfather. Yeah. That is really awesome. That's amazing. So yeah. Um, yeah, so your father. Your father was uh, in World yeah, War II. Yeah, my dad was in World War II. Um, I was born in 1958, so I came around rather late in their life. But um, my dad was uh, um, drafted. He was 27 years old during the war. And uh, he joined the Army uh, and was put in um, a unit from, I guess it would be the Midwest, um, the Kansas National Guard. It was mostly those guys now. My dad, as I am, from upstate New York, so uh, he was what, what they called a replacement. And uh, with a lot of these uh, veterans, um, these replacements were pretty much expendable. So, uh, you know, they sort of took care of their own and, uh, you know, let the new guys share the brunt of, uh, you know, some of the worst fighting or whatever, because, you know, they figure they've been through theirs. So, uh, some of the new guys have a taste of it. So, um, he went over, he was trained as a mortar operator, and um, when he went over, uh, joined the unit, it was about 15 days after D-Day, and uh, one of the first battles they were involved in was in a place called St. Lowe, 
It was basically to uh, get some of the, uh, to help get all the troops that were pinned down on the beaches up into the, uh, um, what the heck did they call that, the Bacaj, which is the, uh, um, all the hedgerow country, which was a real hard, a uh, lot of hard fighting there. Mm -hmm. But um, later on uh, in the campaign, um, they were uh, um, sent to help uh, relieve the 101st Airborne, who was trapped at a place called Bath Stone during the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, my dad being in Patton's 3rd Army, they went by truck, uh, basically mobilized the whole 3rd Army and uh, raced to that area to plug that hole in that big bulge or that big opening that um, Hitler's attack um, had uh, opened up. So. Um, they were fighting in a town just south of Bastogne, very, very deep snow, and uh, it was up to above their knees. And the uh, armored divisions had the roads. The uh, infantry went through the fields. And basically, uh, the way that my dad told the story was uh, they had uh, come up to an area which was uh, very uh, heavily forested. And he said it wasn't like forests here in the United States. These were tall, tall pines, but they were the stumps of them or the uh, the trunks of them were uh, around seven, eight feet high before you actually got to the foliage. So you could look through these long lines of trees. And his uh, sergeant said, uh, "All right, you're a first scout." He said, "Well, I'm a mortar man. I don't know nothing about being a first scout." He goes, "Well, you're a first scout now." He said, "Take us up through those trees up there." My dad's response was, well, that's all Germans up there. And um, the sergeant says, no, the artillery cleared that out last night. You know, there's, there's nobody up in there, you know. So uh, off my dad goes, his official first scout for his rifle um, squad, which consisted of 11 of their men. So uh, as he started going through the woods, he noticed a guy uh, a couple, maybe a couple hundred yards away running. Um, from right to left, wearing a white suit. And he said, I know we didn't have any white suits. And he said, he shot at him, and yellow hit the deck, and my dad fell down in the snow. And uh, the sergeant in the back said, damn it, those are all Americans. And just then, two German machine gun nests opened up and killed the 11 guys that were behind my dad. So my dad laid in the snow by himself. Uh, probably around 20, 30 yards ahead of him. Um, he said that it was uh, so close to one of the machine guns, he said he could smell the heat from it. It was almost burning his nose, so they were basically shooting right over his head. Um, he saw his best friend, uh, who was also a replacement from upstate New York, get shot in the head right next to him. So it was, uh, you know, at, you know, very trying time, of course, and uh, as he laid there, um, which seemed like hours. He said probably it was only about 10 minutes. He said he, had, he was so scared that he, he melted the snow down to bare ground, basically. <laughs> um, so uh, after things quieted down, within a couple minutes, he felt somebody come over and tap him on the head with a rifle. Um, and uh, it was a couple German soldiers. He said he stood up and uh, they were surrounded. There were just there were about 50, 60 guys just waiting for him. They walked right in the middle of an ambush, and there was nothing to do but surrender. I mean, he was up to his waist in snow, and uh, you know, certainly outnumbered. And all the other uh, men of his squad were were killed. So he said they had they took him down to a uh, a dugout that they had prepared. Actually, it was something that was used perhaps by the Americans before that time. And he said, we walked down almost into a little basement kind of thing, um, where down there was a radio operator. And uh, he said, as we sat on this bench and with a German soldier on each side of him, he said, this guy talked nonstop on the radio in German, of course. And my dad realized that uh, he had eaten all day. So uh, remember, he had a Hershey's bar in his jacket. so he, I zipped his coat and pulled out the Hershey bar, and the German took it out of his hands, broke it in half, and in very good broken English said, 50 50, thank you very much, and gave my bad dad back half. Of it. <laughs> he said the other German soldier um, elbowed him and 
pulled out a photograph and it was a picture of um, him before the war with his wife. So my dad had a picture of my mom and my sister that he carried and he showed it to, to the other um, German soldier who said, oh, too bad, too bad. Um, so this, uh, this little exchange went back and forth for a while between the three of them. Um, neither of them really speaking the other language very well at all. My dad knew just some very, very basic stuff in German. Um, and uh, the one soldier said Dusseldorf, pointed to himself, and wanted to know where my dad was from. My dad said New York, in um, which he responded, oh, Yankees. So um, <laughs> it was funny the thing that, you know. They, That's uh, crazy. They know about, uh, you know, American <laughs> culture. Um, so uh, this went back and forth for a while. And uh, he said, I, he heard a vehicle pull up outside and that trap door open and down the steps he said came these beautifully polished boots. He, uh, this guy comes in the best looking uniform we've seen in the entire war. He's in a beautiful long gray coat and this uh, cap with skull and crossbones on it. And he was with the ESS. Oof. And um, he started to uh, interrogate my dad in very good English. And my father said, look, and he said, I'm a replacement, I know nothing. He says, I'm uh, Brian. Basically, after his short, um, very to the point interrogation, the guy said in German to the other two soldiers, uh, take him out and shoot him. And my dad knew enough of German as to, uh, you know, he knew exactly what he said. So uh, the um, officer left. So the two soldiers uh, rose to their feet, got my dad up, and he said, uh, as they left the bunker, he said um, uh, he was just waiting for a bullet, basically, in the back of his head. And uh, they walked through the snow, and uh, they could see all the other troops were leaving, mobilized, and they were getting out of there quickly, uh, which left these two guys and my dad uh, walking through the snow. So he said, we walked for a while, and it was evident they weren't going to be shooting me right away. He said, I don't know where we were heading. Um, so he said, we walked and walked, and again, they kept trying to ask my dad's questions about how far away they were and everything else from the United States and all that. And um, Good, are you? they came up to a, a point where there was a hill, and uh, the guy wanted my dad to stop. He ran to the top of the hill. They could hear squealing noise mm -hmm. off in the distance. And um, he motioned for my dad and the other uh, soldier to come up. And as they reached the top of the hill, they could see about a mile away all the armor divisions of Patton's Third Army coming in. So the two Germans looked at each other, took off their rifles, and handed them to my dad and surrendered to him. That's awesome. So uh, yeah. the three of them returned back to the line, um, met up with the armored divisions, and my dad said, take care of these two guys. They were supposed to kill me. And, uh, you know, they thought it would be more prudent to surrender. So it's an uh, awesome story. That's why I'm here today. <laughs> yeah, and so now you're shooting cameras instead of guns. Yes, exactly. Right? Yeah. Awesome. Exactly. Well, if you guys are looking for uh, to get pictures taken, this is the man to do it. So next stop in Gettysburg, this is where you go. Well, thanks so much.